On December 7, 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack against the United States at Pearl Harbor. A few hours later, they launched an attack against the island of Hong Kong. Just after midnight on the 8th of December, Japan invaded Thailand at Batani and Songla, while another force landed further south on the Malaysian Peninsula at Kota Bahru. Facing stiff resistance, the Japanese fought their way south and by the 13th of January had captured Kuala Lumpur. By the end of the month, the Japanese troops found themselves in positions overlooking the Straits of Johor and into Singapore. The bombardments of Singapore commenced on the 3rd of February and steadily increased over the next five days. The Japanese troops finally crossed the Straits of Johor on the evening of the 8th of February, landing on the northwest shoreline of Singapore and began their push inland. A short but intense battle ensued through the island and by the morning of 15th of February 1942 the Japanese had broken through the last lines of Allied defence. At 5.15 that evening Singapore was formally surrendered to the Japanese by Lieutenant General Percival at the Ford Motor Factory. When Singapore surrendered over a hundred thousand Allied soldiers found themselves prisoners of the Japanese Imperial Army. On the 14th of February 1942, to the south of Singapore on the island of Sumatra, a group of 260 Japanese paratroopers were dropped above oil refineries in Palembang. After the success of these air raids, larger ground forces attacked throughout Java, quickly defeating the Allied troops stationed there. Dutch forces surrendered on the 8th of March 1942, although organised resistance continued in Sumatra until the 28th of March, when the last Dutch commanders surrendered. The Japanese occupation was initially greeted with optimistic enthusiasm by Indonesians. This Indonesian cooperation allowed the Japanese to focus on securing the archipelago's waterways and skies. Japan, in search of resources and an alternative route to avoid Allied attacks, decided to extend an existing railway from West Sumatra to the east coast of the island. This line connected at Moaro in the centre of the island and travelled over 220 kilometres through jungle and swamps, where it would finish in a small riverside town called Pekambaru. The original line had been constructed in the late 19th century by the Dutch and was used to transport coal and rubber from the resource-rich interior of the island to the port of Emma Haven located in Padang on the west coast. The idea of extending this line was not a new one. The Dutch had previously surveyed this area and knew it was possible, but due to the cost of the project and the economy at the time, the plans had to be shelved. To build its growing empire, the Japanese required a large workforce of civilian labour. With the promise of good pay, food and accommodation, large numbers of local Indonesians volunteered to help them achieve their goals. They believed the work they would undertake would not only benefit themselves, but also their country. These people became known as the Rumusa, and in the coming years would work in some of the most horrific conditions. As they sailed away bound for distant ports, they did not realise that many of them would never return home again. During April of 1943, around 120,000 Ramusa were sent to begin construction on what was to become the Peckinburu Death Railway. They arrived on ships that sailed up the Siak River and disembarked in Peckinburu. They were put to work straight away clearing the jungle and building the embankments that the railway would run on. There was no heavy lifting or digging equipment available, meaning the entire railway had to be constructed by hand. It was at this point that the Ramusa realised they had become slaves. Suffering from torture, 
hunger and sickness, these slaves began to die in large numbers. By 1944, locals realized that the Japanese were not liberators and so volunteers became harder to find. The Japanese army still took many locals by force, but it was also decided to utilize the large number of POWs that had been captured at the start of the war to help build the railway. These POWs came from many nationalities, including Dutch, English, American, Australian and New Zealanders. The first group of POWs arrived at the railway on the 19th of March 1944 at Camp 1 on the banks of the Siak River. Between 1944 and 1945, over 5,000 POW successfully made the journey to Sumatra and were forced to construct the railway. This was a perilous journey with Allied ships and submarines patrolling the waters around Indonesia. A Japanese hell ship named the Van Vorwijk was sunk on the 26th of June 1944 by the submarine HMS Truculent with the loss of 198 lives. Then on the 18th of September 1944, the Junyo Maru, another of the Japanese hell ships, was sunk by the Allied submarine HMS Tradewind. 5,600 prisoners bound for the railway perished in this disaster. All of the prisoners worked under the worst possible conditions, with no medical supplies and limited food. To their captors they became expendable objects. The building of the railway continued into 1945, with the conditions growing steadily worse and with larger numbers of POWs dying every week. It is said that a person died for every sleeper laid along the railway. was decided in 1944 to speed up construction of the railway so work was started in Moaro heading east towards Peckinburu through a steep gorge. On the 15th of August 1945 a small ceremony was held a few kilometres west of Camp 10. One year and five months after the construction began the railway was finally joined. This was also the day the Japanese finally surrendered. The Allies began to reoccupy lost territory throughout Indonesia with landings along the coastline. The Japanese commander in Sumatra, Lieutenant General Tanabe, surrendered to the British forces who had landed in Padang, signalling the end of the war for POWs on the railway. With the war over, the POWs responsible for building the railway were transported by rail from their camps back to the airstrip in Peckinburu. The first outsiders to arrive at the camp, including Lady Mountbatten, found groups of men wearing loincloths and homemade shoes and looking like living skeletons. The Allied prisoners needing immediate medical attention were transported to Singapore for treatment. It took a further two months for the liberated prisoners left behind to be evacuated from Peckinburu. The last left on the 25th of November 1945. It is estimated that 700 POWs died building the railway in Sumatra. It is also believed that fewer than 16,000 of the original 120,000 Rumusa survived to see the end of the war and even fewer went home. Within a few years, the bridges crossing the larger rivers, such as the Kampa Kanan and Kampa Keri, had already begun to collapse, and the line was being taken back by the encroaching jungle. In late 1946, many of the Japanese, who had themselves been taken as POWs at the end of the war, were sent back to Japan after being released from prisoner of war camps throughout Indonesia. Those Japanese accused of war crimes remained behind to stand trial. These trials saw two of the Japanese commanders involved with the railway put to death and another 18 handed prison sentences. Peckinburu is now a sprawling metropolis with a population of one and a half million people.
Little remains of the camp on the Siak River, however many of the roads follow the original railway lines laid down over 70 years ago. At the site of the original jetty, where so many POWs were unloaded, it is still possible to see the original piling sticking out of the water. Besides the remains of this jetty lies an old coal barge, one of the many that transported the coal sourced at Camp 14 further south on the line to Singapore and the ports along the coast of Malaysia. If you head into the maze of streets that lie just behind the jetty and down back alleyways, you find old buildings and warehouses that were used by the Japanese to house men and their goods, essential for building a railway. Some of these are still used for their original purpose today, while others have fallen into a state of disrepair. It is also still possible to find pieces of the original rail. The railway from Camp 1 heads south and is the beginning of the journey to Muaro, 220 kilometres away in West Sumatra. The railway takes a winding route away from Camp 1 to climb out of the swamps around the Siak River and continues to Camp 3 on the banks of the Kempa Kanan. One of the main roads leading away from the Siak River is Jalan Locomotive. This road is built on the original embankment that was the railway line. It is quite easy to make out the form of the embankment along this road and you realise how much earth was moved to create it. Loco Village sits beside Jalan Locomotive and was once the site of a steam locomotive's rusting shell. Travelling 14 kilometres south from Camp 1 is the site of Camp 3A at Kubang. This site was one of the many quarries where sand was collected to build the embankments and the bridge approach for the Kampar Kanan River. Camp 3A was built later after the original Camp 3 was flooded due to its proximity to the river. On the banks of the Kampar Kanan River are the original sites of Camp 3 and 4. Camp 3 was situated on the northern side of the river while Camp 4 was on the southern side. A large wooden bridge approximately 200 metres long was constructed here to span the river. This bridge was destroyed by a large flood in 1949 and floods over the last 70 years have removed large amounts of the approach to where this bridge would have stood. From here, the railway continues south passing through camps 5 and 6. These areas are very swampy due to the low-lying nature of this area and flood quite regularly. The railway runs besides what is now the main road south to Talakwantan and in places has been turned into a side road for the villagers. Close to Camp 6, besides the railway, the remnants of a breaking down saw have been found. This was used by the POWs to make the sleepers that were required for the railway to sit on. Sixty kilometres south of Pekinbaru is the Kampakiri River. This is the location of Camp 7 and 7A. These camps were built on the opposite sides of the river so that the bridge crossing at this point could be built from both sides at the same time. In 1944, during a large flood, the POWs that were camped here were forced to fend off logs and other debris that was impacting the bridge. Others were forced to swim between the pilings to release debris that could not be removed with long poles. The area outlined here is the actual location of Camp 7A. A short drive across the equator brings you to the location of Camp 7 on the south side of the Kampakiri River. Between rubber trees and amongst the undergrowth lies the remains of a rusting steam locomotive left behind at the end of the war. This locomotive was a C-54 class and was one of four that were brought from Java to Pekinbaru in order to transport coal from the mine at Camp 14 to the port on the Siak River. One of the C-54 locomotives still exists and is preserved at Ambarawa Railway Museum in Java. Close by are the remains of another sawmill of the same design as previously seen at Camp 6. This sawmill was larger than the last with extra saw pits being visible amongst the undergrowth. From Camp 7, the railway begins winding its way along the eastern bank of the Singingi River and passes through Camp 8 at Kotabaru and then on to Camp 9 at Logos. Camp 8 is located 111 kilometres from Pekinbaru and sat between the river and the railway. 
The railway at Kotabaru can be found easily today, as it is one of the streets that runs parallel to the main road. The line is surrounded by much older houses which show the site of the original village. The line was built through the middle of this village and winds its way between the houses. Local agriculture in the area quite often uncover sections of the railway and this embankment shows that well. The local farmer had cleared the scrub away to plant a small plot of palm oil and uncovered the railway in the process. This section ran beside a small creek and then crossed into a cutting on the other side. Lying beside the embankment was a steel sleeper for the narrow gauge line that was located at the coal mine. As the line progressed from Camp 7 along the river the terrain became much more hilly with many valleys to cross. This cutting is typical of those found along the railway and is how these valleys were linked without taking the longer winding route at the foot of the hills. 25 kilometres further south from Camp 8, the railway passes through Camp 9 at Logos. From here the railway began its turn to the west heading towards Camp 10 at the foot of the Bucket Barrows and Mountains. The pilings of the bridge just outside Camp 9 are still visible in the river today. In 2015, an Anzac Day ceremony was held in remembrance of the POWs at the site of Camp 9. Between Camp 8 and 9 was the beginning of a branch line to the Sapa and Kuroi coal mines. This branch line took a relatively straight route following the Tapi River west to the foothills of the Bukit Barrows and Mountains. Once at the foothills, the railway changed to a smaller 700mm gauge and then followed the Tarpi Gorge deeper into the mountains. This section of railway used a small locomotive built by Krauss, which was transported from North Sumatra in 1942. It was numbered DSM-30 and this nameplate was sold to a collector when the locomotive was scrapped in 1998. Vehicle access today is limited to four-wheel drives only as the road is extremely steep and rough. At the top, the ruggedness of the country becomes apparent, and it is unbelievable to think that a railway was constructed in this area. Here, the railway is directly below, besides the river. The line follows the river along its south bank until it reaches Camp 14. This part of the narrow gauge railway is cut into cliffs and passes through many cuttings. These cuttings can be extremely deep and very narrow. This line also had viaducts that were fastened to the cliffs and areas that were too steep to cut tracks and embankments into. The engineering involved in building this part of the railway surpasses that of any normal railway, but much of the information relating to it has been lost in history. So hopefully we're coming towards the, um, the bridge put in by the prisoners of war and uh, Javanese rooms back in 43-44. Once the foliage has been cleared, the effort required to construct these cuttings becomes apparent. Beneath the ground and in the river below, steel sleepers remain as a reminder of the railway. Some of these sleepers were extracted for preservation, and due to the steepness of the area, the easiest way to do this was to float them down the river. <laughs> To reach the coal mine, there are a minimum of four river crossings and these flood often, especially in the wet season between November and January. The Tapi River is no exception to this and can also be very hazardous to cross. A group of 438 POWs made up of Dutch, English and Australians nicknamed the Arche Party for a road that they constructed in the Arche province of North Sumatra were transported to Camp 14 overland and arrived here sometime around midnight in November 1944. Their first job was to construct a camp. This outline shows the location of this camp today. It is a large flat area set back from the Tapi River and is covered in palm oil. Many relics from 70 years ago are still easily located with the help of a metal detector 
as the site has been relatively undisturbed. Railway spikes are easy to find, but tools and electrical components also lie just below the surface. The electrical components show the scale of the operation in this area, as the electricity would have allowed for 24-hour work parties at the mine to extract the coal. A bridge was built beside Camp 14 for the railway by Arche Party POWs, and the pilings of this are still visible in the river today. Travelling further up the river, a large flat area had been cleared and it is possible to find a loading area where the coal would have been tipped from the hand carts that came from the mine into the waiting carriages of the locomotive. One and a half kilometres from the loading area is the reason for all of the effort. Here, a large seam of coal has been pushed to the surface by the seismic actions in the area, making the mining a very straightforward process. The coal here has been mined off and on since the end of the war and is still easily found just below the surface. In 2002 it was still possible to see the tunnels in the coal face with small pieces of rail still lying at the entrance points. In total, 120,000 metric tonnes were mined from here during the war, transported along the railway to Peckinburrow and the Siak River. Back on the main line, the railway begins its trip west passing through Camp 10, 11, 12 and finishing in Muaro at Camp 13. From Logos, the railway no longer follows the main road to Talakwantan and instead passes through many old villages on its way to Camp 10. Much of this part of the line is used as access roads to these areas. A cutting was recently uncovered on this section of line in preparation for planting with palm oil. Much of the cutting was destroyed by the process of clearing the trees, but small parts like this still remain. Camp 10 lies on the banks of the Indragiri River in a small village called Kotakombu. Links of railway irons denote the location of the railway in the village. As the railway heads west, it enters the beginnings of the Kwantan Gorge, which is the only suitable path for a railway line to cross from the east coast to the west coast of Sumatra through the Bukit Barazan Mountains. The gorge itself is a mixture of small flat areas that exist between the hillside and the river, or sheer cliffs that rise up for hundreds of metres, which needed to be blasted so that the railway could pass by. Due to the terrain and its remoteness, many of the embankments and cuttings still exist 70 years on and are still easily visible from the air. Below, a large cutting stands out amongst the trees and the line can be seen curving its way back to the village and then passing it on the north side. From this point onwards, the construction of the railway also includes concrete retaining walls and bridge pilings, with the concrete being brought from the Padang cement works along the railway. Entry to the cutting can be made by driving to the west end of Kotakombu and then walking along the line through dense scrub and open rubber plantations. The cutting itself runs for almost 700 metres, with the deepest section being about 200 metres long. The undergrowth has covered much of the rock face along the cutting, but it is easy to see that it was cut through solid rock, with the walls being over 25 metres high in some points. This cutting bears a striking similarity to that of Hellfire Pass on the Thai Burma Railway and was probably constructed in a very similar way. Back in Kotakombu, Camp 10 was located near the intersection of the railway and access road from Lubuk Umbachang across the river. The line is clearly visible from the air as it is used by the locals to access small villages beside the river. After one and a half kilometres, the road ends and the line disappears back into the jungle. Two kilometres further east from this point, the remnants of a Hanomag steam locomotive used to sit down a bank, but this was cut up for scrap, with the last piece being removed in 2005. 
The reason for the locomotive being here is up for debate, as some say that the rail was sabotaged causing the locomotive to fall off the line, while others say that it took the corner too fast. The Hannah Mag locomotive was one of the largest to work on the railway. They were transported from the railway in North Sumatra to Padang and remained on the line until the end of the war. Some like the locomotive in the picture, which also served its time on the Pekambaru to Muara Railway, found their way back to North Sumatra before being scrapped in the 1980s. From Camp 10 it is no longer possible to drive along the railway, and the only way to reach Camps 11 and 12 is by travelling on the main road to West Sumatra. Around 20 kilometres from Camp 10, Rio Province is left behind and West Sumatra lies ahead. Not far past the change of province, a small road on the right gives access back towards the Indragiri River. Passing through terraced rice paddies and over steep mountain passes, the road ends at the village of Padang Tarok and a large swing bridge. This bridge gives access to the village, which is also the location of Camp 11. Access to the railway here is by walking along the village pathways, passing many old buildings in the local Minang style. On the western side of the village, the railway would have crossed a deep valley, although no sign of the bridge remains. The railway heading west is visible below, having become the easiest form of access between villages, before again disappearing into the trees. Some of the embankment in this area has been concreted at some point to give a smoother track. In one place, the track moves off the embankment due to a river crossing, but the railway continues into a small overgrown cutting. This cutting leads to a small, deep valley where there would have been a high trestle bridge. Back over Padang to Rock, the railway runs through the centre of the village, heading back to the east and towards Camp 10. A short walk along the embankment, through the trees and undergrowth, allows access to the site of another large bridge, although all that remains is the concrete footings and bolts for holding the beams above. Not everything has disappeared though, as a small amount of railway can still be found crossing a creek, near where it is again lost in the jungle. The embankment to this point has been concreted, but still retains the unmistakable shape of a railway. Around halfway between camps 11 and 12, large concrete pilings are easily visible where a large bridge crossed a river entering the Indragiri. There are also large footings for a viaduct where the railway follows a cliff, rather than constructing an embankment. Both of these sites require access to a canoe, as there is no easy way of reaching these areas. To find Camp 12 after visiting Camp 11 requires driving on roads that cross more mountain passes, and which ultimately end at Muaro. From here it is possible to follow the original railway besides the Indragiri River as it winds its way eastward. The embankment has become an important road to access the areas deeper into the gorge and the many gold dredges that work the area. Driving deeper into the gorge, the cliffs begin to grow on either side of the river and large rock faces begin to appear that were cut through by the POWs to enable the railway to progress. The embankment in places has slipped towards the river as the large floods that frequent the area have taken their toll. Flat areas within the gorge are few and far between. Today, these areas are taken up by small dwellings for servicing the gold dredges or small rice paddies to feed the local population. This section of the railway was deemed difficult by the Japanese and cost the lives of many Ramusha and POWs. Many Ramusha were caught in rock slides created by the Japanese when they detonated their dynamite to blast tracks into the cliffs. Near Camp 12 is the grave of the famous Dutch surveyor W. H. de Grieve, who discovered the Omblin coal fields. On the 22nd of October 1872, he drowned when the canoe he was travelling in overturned in the Kwantan Gorge. The site of his grave is on the south side of the river across a small swing bridge. The gorge is also home to huge bats, which can be seen when they are disturbed, 
At its narrowest, the gorge is only about 50 metres wide, with the cliffs towering over 300 metres high above the railway as the line hugs the northern side of the river. It would have been in this area that a rocky overhang collapsed onto a locomotive as it passed beneath, shaken loose by the vibration and noise. The rocks have been blasted and cut through to allow just enough room for the track to pass between so that the locomotives wouldn't get stuck on anything. 70 years on, many of the people who stopped to admire the beauty of this area would never realise the hardship of the people who built the line that has become the road that they were now driving on. The rock face in places along the gorge still show drill holes, which were filled with dynamite to blow away the rocks so that the railway could be built. Near the site of Camp 12, a locomotive that was left in the valley has been turned into a small monument to those who worked on the railway. Like many other relics along the railway, much of the locomotive had been removed by the locals for scrap until it came to sit where it does today. The locomotive is a C-33 class which was one of the stalwarts of the West Sumatran Railway, with over 20 being built. This is the same type of locomotive that can be seen on the Peckinborough Monument and the plinth outside Padang Railway Station. In 1974, some of these locomotives were filmed while operating. The majority of these locomotives were scrapped in the late 80s. Behind the locomotive, a concrete mural depicts the building of the railway by the Ramusha and their torturous treatment by the Japanese. In 2014, a local Indonesian broadcaster interviewed one of these Ramusha, who was forced to build the railway through the gorge. Back to the west towards Muaro and Camp 13, the line passes between terraced rice paddies in the hills. Many of the embankments are quite high in order to cross the swampy ground created by streams flowing towards the river. In many places, pieces of rail are visible on the ground which have been used to support earthworks or for bridges built by the locals to cross streams. As the track leaves the gorge, it arrives at Camp 13 and Muaro. Camp 13 was built very close to the Muaro railway station. The station itself had been built in the early 20th century as it was where the original Dutch railway line from Padang ended. Many POWs arrived at the station after disembarking ships at Emmerhaven which was the local port at Padang. Many of them travelled down the railway towards Peckinborough at this point to help construct the line through the gorge. The railway here still belongs to the government and has never been removed in case it is needed again. Two carriages used on the railway still sit on what would have been a siding besides the station. They have been converted by the locals over the years to suit their own needs and have become part of the surrounding buildings. The original water tower for the station still stands beside the local school and is in good condition. The line to Pekinbaru passed Muaro Station on the north side and travelled 300 metres along an embankment before it crossed the Injugiri River. From here, Camp 12 was 20 kilometres downstream along the north bank of the Kwantan Gorge. In Pekinbaru, there is a monument to those who built the railway. Until 2013, this monument was in a dire state of disrepair, but it is now looked after by a local gardener. The monument is for the Palawan Kurja, or work heroes. The graves nestled between the monument and the locomotive are of Ramusha who died locally after the end of the war. 
Beneath the locomotive, a concrete mural depicts the Ramusha constructing the railway for the Japanese. It also depicts their suffering, hunger and fight with the Japanese. This map at the end of the monument gives a rough guide to the railway and camp locations. It is with hope that the people that constructed this railway and the location of the camps and embankments are never forgotten so that future generations are able to trace their history.